There's a story, it's an old story, I don't know if it's a true story, about a lighthouse keeper. And this lighthouse keeper worked on a rocky stretch of coastline somewhere along the Atlantic Ocean. And once a month, he would receive a supply of oil that kept the light burning in the lighthouse. The light was, is important because it guided ships and it kept them from crashing into the rocky coast. So the job of the lighthouse keeper, maintaining the supply of oil that kept the light lit, was crucial. Now this particular lighthouse keeper was a very compassionate human being. And there would be people who would come to him with requests for just a little bit of oil. The lighthouse keeper always had a supply of oil. Not everyone else did. So one night a woman from a nearby village came and begged him for some oil that she could use to fuel the heater in her home that was keeping her family warm. So this compassionate lighthouse keeper gave her some oil. Another time a father asked for some oil to use in a lamp that provided light for his children to study their homework. This compassionate lighthouse keeper gave the father some of the oil. And then another man came, and he needed some oil to lubricate a wheel on his wagon that helped to bring in the harvest from the field. Compassionate lighthouse keeper gave him some oil. This happened over and over and over again. And every request seemed legitimate. And the lighthouse keeper tried to please everyone, meet their needs, and grant the request for oil. Well, you can guess what happened. Toward the end of the month, he noticed his supply of oil was dangerously low, and soon it was gone. And one night, the light on the lighthouse went out. And as a result, that evening, several ships were wrecked. And countless lives were injured and even lost. When the authorities investigated, the lighthouse keeper was very apologetic. He told them he was just trying to be helpful to his neighbors by giving them oil. And their reply to his excuse was this. You were given oil for one purpose and one purpose only, to keep that light Burning. The purpose of the church is clear. We are called to do one thing. We are called to help at least one more person come to know the love of God through Jesus Christ and the gift of life abundant and eternal life that only Jesus can offer. That's our purpose. That's the only reason we exist as a church. God comes to us today just like those authorities went to that lighthouse keeper and God says to us, you have one purpose. And that purpose is to offer the light of Christ to the world. To keep the light of Christ burning brightly in and through your lives so that the world might know that Jesus 
is the answer to everything they are searching for. Have you noticed our world is confused? <laughs> and desperate? All you have to do is spend five minutes looking at the television, going online and looking at Facebook, and Twitter, reading a news article, and you realize that our world is filled with people who are desperately searching for meaning and purpose and significance and hope. And friends, they are being offered all these counterfeit solutions by the world around us. And here we sit, as the church of Jesus Christ, with the truth, with the name of the one who will give them everything they need. Our purpose is clear. We're to offer Jesus to everyone we meet. And we do it through our actions, and we do it with our words. When I think about why the church of today has so much trouble with fully living our mission, and we do have trouble living our mission sometimes. I visit a lot of churches. And there's a lot of churches that are just like that lighthouse keeper. They're well-intentioned. They're doing lots of great things in the community. But in the midst of all of those things, they're not offering Jesus. They're not sharing with people why it is they're doing the good things. They've forgotten their purpose. Or worse are the churches that gather together, have a great time, and see the world beyond their walls as the enemy. Churches that say, we don't want them to come in here. We don't need to go out there. We like each other. Somehow, some way, at some point, churches have forgotten the purpose. They've forgotten the promises of our God. And some of that is because we've lost our memory of who we are and what is possible in us and through us because we are the people of God. We've lost that memory. We've lost that ability to trust. Today is the baptism of the Lord Sunday in the church calendar. And I want you to hear the account of Jesus' baptism. Because I believe there's two truths for us to recognize in this passage that will help us in keeping our purpose. Hear these words from the Gospel of Matthew. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? But Jesus answering said to him, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Word of God, for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
The account of Jesus' baptism is a marvelous memory event. As we look at this account of Scripture, I believe God speaks to us and reminds us of who He is, of who we are, and what God desires to do and promises to do in our lives individually, but more importantly, in our life together as the church. So very quickly, I want to look at two things. First, the baptism of Jesus is all about purpose. It's about God's purpose, and it's about our purpose. Jesus came to earth for one reason. To provide a way for us to be reconnected to God. To be reconciled. Jesus came to earth for one reason. To move us from a state of sinfulness to a state of sinlessness. The Bible makes it very clear that sin and God cannot coexist. Sinful humanity cannot be in intimate relationship with a holy God. Romans 3.23 shares that reality. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Keep reading in Romans. And you see that that bad news has continued to be shared. But then the good news. Romans 6. 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus came for one reason. He came to be the sacrifice for our sin. To offer us a way of forgiveness. That in turning toward him, we would be turned away from the effect of sin in our lives. This is not a popular message today. It's not a popular message in the church even. But the result of what we see happening in the world around us is a consequence of sin. The state of sin and the act of sin. But you see, when we trust in Jesus, claim his purpose, we become a forgiven and new creation. I love the words of 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, what? They are, they are a new creation. The old has passed. Behold, the new has arrived. The baptism that John offered was a baptism of repentance. The baptism that John offered demanded that a person recognize their sin, make a decision to turn away from that sin, and live a new life. Jesus didn't have sin. Yet, he was baptized. Why? To demonstrate his purpose. To show his desire to stand in our place. To take sin upon himself. To become like us. Don't miss this. So that we would become like him. We stop with God became one of us. But the reason God became one of us was so that we could become like God. That we could become one of God's beloved. Listen again to Matthew 3, 13 to 15. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John, to be baptized by him. 
But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. Jesus said, permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. You see, the baptism of Jesus reminds us of God's purpose. It also reminds us of our purpose. Any of you ever hear of a book that was written a long time ago called The Purpose Driven Church? And then there was another book called The Purpose Driven Life. Churches throughout the United States gathered in small groups to study that book. It was written by Rick Warren, who is a pastor in, Cal in California. We Wesleyans had some theological difficulties with some of that book. But for the most part, it was a book that was a blessing to every church that engaged with it. And that book identified that there are five reasons, five pieces, to the way we are called to live as Christians. We are called to love God, worship, we are called to love each other, fellowship. We are called to grow and become more like Jesus, discipleship. We're called to serve one another in the body, ministry. And we're called to see, serve the, world, the needs of the world, mission. That book is a reminder of our purpose. Just as the baptism of Jesus is a reminder of our purpose as well. As Jesus agreed to walk into our lives, he says we must agree to walk into his way of life. And you know what his way of life is? He told us in Mark chapter 12. When someone said to him, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And your neighbor as yourself. There's no greater commandment than this. We've made those words pretty in the church. But do we understand the depth of what those words mean? Do I understand the depth of what those words mean? Those words mean nothing becomes more important than God in my life. Nothing. Nothing becomes more important than making sure others have the opportunity to join us in experiencing and loving God with all that we have. Nothing. Not the kind of music we like. Not the style of worship we like. Not our traditions or our agendas. I told this story before. A friend of mine was a district superintendent like Reverend Anderson, and he was meeting with a church that was going to get a new pastor. And he was talking with the, the staff parish committee, and they were sitting in the back of the sanctuary, and the group was talking about the kind of pastor that they needed. And this one woman said, We need a pastor who will do whatever it takes to make sure that people know Jesus. And my friend looked at her and said, whatever it takes? And she said, absolutely. And he pointed to the front of the sanctuary and said, so if that means getting rid of your organ and replacing it with drums and guitars and a trumpet, you're okay with that. And that woman looked at my friend and said, over my dead body. <laughs> you see when God calls us to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind and strength and our neighbor as ourselves it's a call to surrender it's a call to follow God's way not ours it's called to do whatever it takes 
to fall deeper in love with God and be riskier in extending that love of God to the world around us. There's a second truth in this baptism. Not only does the baptism remind us of our purpose and God's purpose, but it reminds us of the promise that has been given to us of power. Holy Spirit power. The verse says to us, after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened. The Spirit of God descended as a dove, and a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Let me test your Bible trivia. When else do we see the heavens opened and something descending as a dove? Pentecost. The Holy Spirit descending, rushing wind, <coughs> appeared as if tongues of fire. Pentecost brought the power that Jesus had promised to the church through the gift of the Holy Spirit. At Jesus' baptism, the dove descending upon him was that presence of the Holy Spirit, that power that God offers, that power that allowed Jesus to continue to, as a man to continue to say yes to the agenda of the divine. And that same power is given to us. You've probably heard this story before, a young boy traveling by airplane to visit his grandparents and he was sitting next to a seminary professor. And the boy was reading a, a Sunday school take-home paper, and the professor noticed it, and the seminary professor thought he'd have a little fun with the boy, and he said, young man, if you can tell me something God can do, I'll give you an apple. The boy thought for a moment and then said, mister, if you can tell me something God can't do, I'll give you my candy bar. <laughs> Part of the baptism of Jesus account reminds us that there is nothing we cannot do as the church of Jesus Christ because we have been promised the power of God through the Holy Spirit. Somewhere along the lines in the church, we've stopped believing that all things are possible with God. Instead, we've got into this mindset of, oh, we can't do that. That's beyond our abilities. Our church is too small to engage in that. We tried that before, it failed. The baptism of Jesus reminds us that the power of God, not our power, but the power of God is promised to us is guaranteed to us. And it is the power of God that fuels our ability to live our purpose. I wish we all would memorize the words from Ephesians 3.20. And Eugene Peterson, in his translation of the Bible called The Message, says it this way. God can do anything, you know. Far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us. His spirit deeply and gently within us. Glory to God in the church. Glory to God in the Messiah in Jesus. Glory down all the generations. Gloria through all millennia. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You have a piece of furniture over here. that represents something that a lot of you gathered around. Many of you were a baby, so you don't remember it. Some of you were adults, and you do. 
But there was a time where you were baptized. And the baptism of Jesus invites us to remember our baptism. Because the truth of the baptism of Jesus is the truth of our baptism. Because we are baptized into Christ, we have a purpose. And that is to live our lives for Christ and to offer our Christ to the world around us. And we are given power. Holy Spirit power. that means the task that God calls us to will always be successful, will always bear fruit. Because with God's purpose and God's power, we cannot fail. So may we remember our baptism. For the sake of Jesus Christ, for the sake of being who God has called us to be. Amen. Amen.